for now, what we want to do is we want to pause and realizing that this is something that is not just uh, you know, very financially and intellectually and, and, uh, in, you know, and, and, and challenging process, but first and foremost, this is a human interaction and a human journey that the vast majority of people uh, not only do not do uh, at all, personally, but don't even know people who have gone through it. So before you embark on this journey, uh, we're going to try to spend the next uh, almost hour talking about uh, trying to generalize a little more about the things that you've heard at the personal stories panel and try to go down. And, so you've heard, <clears throat> sorry, anecdotal, you know, uh, uh, you know, personal experiences about people who had a great experience this way and, you know, uh, uh, interesting uh, experience that way. And the people on this panel, uh, from personal experience and professional experience, have uh, seen, you know, a very broad range of uh, surrogacy journeys, uh, surrogates, intended parents, um, and professionals. And we're going to try to generalize on that and try to get down to how, what does that mean for you? for your concerns, for the concerns of the surrogate, for um, the outcomes. Uh, that, is this the kind of process that, uh, because some of you might say, how does it even work uh, so well, the way we've heard it might work? So we're going to try to break it down in those ways and, and generalize a little more uh, about some of the things that we've heard before. Um, and what we're going to do first, so first of all, let me introduce our panel. Uh, or why don't we just go around and everybody say a couple words about themselves. So Corina, go ahead. Hello everyone, I'm Corina Guerzoni. I come from Italy. I have a PhD in cultural anthropology and I am a researcher at Western Fertility Institute. I'm doing a research on US surrogacy and I'm interviewing donors, surrogates and intended fathers. I started uh, to study surrogacy in 2012, so I am following a lot of um, patient and in, uh, people involved in the surrogacy experience. I'm, I'm also a professor at uh, University of Milan. I teach anthropology and thank you for being here. <laughs> I'm Michelle Pine. I'm on the board of directors of Men Having Babies and then also a two-time surrogate. I carried twins for an Israeli couple in 2015 and then um, a little girl for our guys from San Francisco in 2017. I actually just had lunch with him a little bit ago. Nice. I'm Kim Bergman, I'm a licensed psychologist, and I'm one of the senior partners at Growing Generations. I've been working in the family building world for my entire career, 30 years. I know, I look young, 30 years um, <laughs> in family building. So um, the first thing I'm going to st start with is uh, one concern we sometimes hear, uh, sometimes in the press, more times then maybe uh, uh, typically outside the United States. But the first question is, what are the long-term outcomes as far as what research say, can show us regarding the uh, mental well-being of the people involved? Uh, is surrogacy good for you, for them, for the baby, for the surrogates? Um, and we're not, this is not a scientific uh, panel, and we're not going to go into uh, the research uh, too deeply, but Corina, can you give us a broad overview of what we already yes. know? Yes, um, it's growing the body of literature that is um, working on surrogacy, and the first uh, um, research study has been managed by Cambridge University, and uh, they, they see and they follow the surrogate after the delivery throughout the journey to see the well-being, and the study say that uh, there are no uh, complications after the uh, surrogacy journey because one of the most fear is what about if she changed her mind and what about after the delivery? And the studies show that uh, there are no depression, there are no, and, and there is a very well-being. Uh, another study was conducted in Columbia University and the same in recently has shown that there are no uh, psychological effect on the life of surrogates and uh, the same uh, group that uh, of Cambridge University that studies surrogacy 20, 10 years ago uh, they made a long term so after 10 years they followed the uh, the journey of this person 10 years 
after and they notice that there are not any uh, complication or differences between being uh, a surrogate after 10 years. And they uh, talk, talk about their relationship about the intending parents and the um, surrogates and the child and everything is fine and the studies, scientific studies show that. So no adverse uh, you know, mental health uh, long-term outcomes for the surrogates we know. Uh, yes. Studies also looked at the surrogates' children. Yes, yes, because as uh, we have seen this morning, uh, surrogacy involves also the partner of the surrogates as well the children of the surrogates. So uh, psychological um, research has um, uh, also studied uh, the psychological uh, evaluation of children of surrogates and also the children born through surrogacy, and there are no any evidence scientifically uh, speaking that can there are uh, bad uh, outcomes of this relationship. As we said uh, this morning, it depends on how surrogacy is built, the relationship is built and managed throughout the journey and how all the people collaborate throughout uh, this uh, project. Um, do you want to add anything, Kim? Um, just the, 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 those studies are really, the longitudinal studies that you were talking about um, are really fantastic for looking, you know, over time, not just immediately. And we have also several studies here in the U.S. I have a study, actually a paper coming out later this year in the Journal of um, Gay and Lesbian Studies and also a, a, an article a couple of years ago that have the same exact results, that the children are great, the, the surrogates are doing great, their families are happy, and we also have a study on egg donors. They're also happy and have no regrets and feel good about what they did. And, and let me just uh, say that there, has been, there have been large uh, studies, there have been uh, more uh, focus uh, uh, studies. I've heard at least one a a ASRM uh, small study a few years ago that uh, you know talked about maybe children of surrogates might uh, develop some anxieties about them maybe being taken away as well, like the baby that was in you know the surrogate's tummy right now. And I think what we know is a that of course it's a very complex uh, set of relationships, but I think what we know at the end of the day, it's not something you're powerless about. It's the quality of the relationship, the quality of the experience. And the communication. And, 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 and the awareness, the education. And it's not, it's not correlated to gender or to technology or to anything like that. It's the quality of the experience. For instance, in our, we'll talk about it later, in our best practices guide, we talk about the importance of you visiting the surrogate at her home. If she's willing to you know, invite you and accept, and accept you, which the vast majority do, so that her children can meet you, the prospective parents. Mm -hmm. And there's no doubt, if anything, that that could alleviate any uh, confusion that they might have. Uh, but moving on, as I said, this is not, we're not doing justice to this topic by far. Uh, by all means, come to me. I have like a really good summary uh, news, uh, email that I can easily forward to you if you're interested in this a little more. Uh, we've collaborated with some of these studies. We still do. And, um, and we, as part of our mission statement, uh, is that we want to encourage more studies because I think everybody would agree that there's room for that and, and we can learn from it. It's not just thumbs up, thumbs down, but it teaches us also what to look at. Um, so, Kim, as you know, talk about the quality of the relationship and the process. Um, when IPs, you guys know that you're IPs, correct, oh, by now. You probably heard it 10 times today. Uh, and you'll be IPs even after you have uh, kids. You'll, go, you'll be former IPs. Um, what, are the, what are the kind of, of concerns they might have beyond the financial and the medical and, and all this learning curve about this process before they embark on it from the mental health or psychological aspect? Mm -hmm. um, so. If you hear me talk, you hear me say this, I say it all the time. Surrogacy, ethical, ethically done, is a collaboration between a whole bunch of fully informed consenting adults who are all coming together for one common purpose, and that purpose is for you to be parents. So um, 
like any good collaboration, there are some ingredients that will make this more or less successful. Things that are needed for a healthy collaboration are trust, honesty, transparency, good communication, realistic expectations, communicating about expectations, um, authenticity, um, uh, a certain amount of flexibility. Um, these are the ingredients of a healthy relationship. You will absolutely have a baby without any of that stuff through surrogacy, but you will not be happy. It will not be fun because it is a marathon and it is a roller coaster. So you've got a roller coaster marathon. You want to be as happy as you can be and as joyous as you can. And the way to accomplish that is to have realistic expectations of the process and of your surrogate and to be in good communication with her. In terms of the matching um, with a surrogate and the relationship, it is a very unique relationship. It is, um, it is a wonderful relationship, but it's very, very unique. It is also not one type of relationship. Some surrogates want a very close relationship with intended parents. Some are willing to be texted 10 times a day and have you show up all the time. Some are not. Some have, you know, they're a, the PTA president, the soccer mom, they have a job and they have three kids. They're incredible. Surrogates are kind of incredible. They're like a whole different species and they're, they're pretty superhuman. But you know, they're, they're, there's a range of personalities and there's a range of expectations. Same is true for intended parents. There is not one way to have a relationship. There's not a way to do it wrong. There isn't a way to do it right. But what is really important is getting everyone's expectations on the table. Sometimes people will say, like, I don't, let's not tell her about X because we don't want to scare her. No, you definitely want to scare her. If she's going to be scared, you want to scare her at the beginning where there's no jeopardy. You don't want this relationship to be um, inauthentic. What I tell people to prepare for meeting with your surrogate and what I tell surrogates for the first time meeting with your intended parents, it's sort of like a job interview first date. You do want to put your best foot forward. You know, you don't want to lead with all your, I don't know, your weaknesses. You want to put your best foot forward. But you also want to be authentic because you do not want to marry the wrong person or go, you don't want to get hired for the wrong job if it's not a good match. And this is similar. You want to be authentic. You want to interview each other. So the parents and the surrogate are really, it's an exchange of who we are and what our expectations are, um, but with authentic authenticity. And then the relationship blossoms over time and evolves into an, a, a more organic relationship. So Michelle, so the, the, the IP is here sitting, you know, they hear Kim and they understand it's a relationship. It might, they might be afraid it's going to be awkward and it's not okay. fully something that be. they control. <laughs> right. uh, but we'll talk about a little more about what we can do about it in, in a minute, uh, beyond, which is very more important uh, uh, to adjust expectations. What are the surrogates' uh, trepidations and concerns when they embark on this, uh, from, from your experience and, and your, your personal and, and overall witnessing? So a uh, couple of things um, to be worried about or that they might have worries about the um, IPs who may be too controlling, right? And you're going to want me to eat all organic food or I'm going to, you know, never going to be able to do exercise the way that I've worked out before or things like that. So um, there is a level of control that you want to have, but there's also a level of trust, like you said, that you have to have that she's doing and she's done this before, right? I'm an expert at this. I did this three times before I did it for someone else. I know what I'm doing and you've got to trust that piece of that. Um, and then there's the huge fear, just like you have this huge fear that she's going to want to run away with your baby. Um, there's a huge fear that you're going to back out and not want that. And every surrogate I've had is, what happens if they decide they don't want this baby? I don't want another baby. Um, and, and so how, what are the contingencies for that? What's going to happen if you guys back out along the way? Or if something happens to you throughout the pregnancy? And just so you know, put your minds at ease for a moment. In real life, in terms of number of cases in the U.S., there have been more cases of, of intended parents abandoning their children. There have never been a surrogate who changed her mind, who worked with an agency, 
who were who was screened and who was an appropriate right. candidate. The and, and that's the key there: who mm -hmm. who was screened appropriately, who yeah. had the appropriate psychological evaluation. There is a, a slew of things that you have to go through to be a, a surrogate to ensure that you were prepared for this process and that you're ready to, at the yeah. end of the day, give back that baby. Yeah, but for in in our process and in, in most agency processes. It's about a six month screening process with many, many, many steps. And we only, uh, only typically about 2% of the women mm -hmm. who start the process actually finish the process and are accepted to be a surrogate. So being a woman who can carry a baby and wanting to do it is just the first step. It's, it's definitely not enough. So in the reality is that surrogates Women who are appropriately screened and who are who should be surrogates don't they don't change their mind they don't do crazy stuff they don't smoke and do drugs while they're pregnant they don't leave the country they don't refuse to have a procedure or do something they're not supposed to do they actually just don't do that. There's a level of um, almost being more concerned I feel like yes. with, with with a surrogacy pregnancy. So on my own pregnancies I might have you know eaten sushi once or twice, or I might have had a glass of red wine at the end of the, you know, the third trimester or something. And with a surrogacy pregnancy, it, none of those things were happening. Anything that my doctor said to do, this is what you have to do. Any sort of minor complication where with my own kid, I might have been like, oh, that feels a little weird, oh, whatever. I, it's, oh, this feels a little weird, call the midwife right now, what's going on, this is weird, call Jimmy, you know, freaking out. So they're much more concerned about your child um, than their own pregnancies. Mm -hmm. And, and, and this is really important because part of what we see from prospective parents is this, they, they say this is such an amazing group of surrogates we just heard from at the personal stories panel. How do I know that I'm going to be as lucky? You know, this is so, uh, such a, it might be so awkward and so difficult. How do I know that I'll be able to manage that relationship? And the first thing we're hearing here is that it's, it's, she's not going to be, able, it's not going to be a relationship with a random woman. Mm -hmm. It's going to be a relationship and the process you'll do together with somebody who is the opposite of random. She which, has been selected for this. Which is why you need professionals to help you. Even if you're not going to use an agency, which I highly recommend you do use an agency, but even if you're not going to use an agency, you need to make sure that you have the professionals, the expertise of professionals. You need a lawyer who specializes in reproductive law. And that is actually, if you're not going to go with an agency, that is the number one most important person on your team, mm -hmm. that you're working with a knowledgeable attorney in reproductive <coughs> law who can, get, who can make sure that those other steps are happening. <laughs> then you need a mental health provider who's knowledgeable, who's going to screen your surrogate, who's going to talk to you, who's going to help you with the match, and obviously need a reproductive endocrinologist. But it's really important not to take any shortcuts because it is such an intricate process. And because it's such a fraught, potentially fraught process, you know, it is a very complex process, but at the same time, incredibly straightforward. And when it's done right, it's actually almost completely risk free, other than the obvious medical risks that nobody can control. With surrogacy pregnancies, actually miscarriages and, and birth issues are actually less and mitigated less than the general population because you have sperm, egg, embryo, uterus so scrutinized, but you still can't yeah, control. Using the best uh, in, uh, fertility yeah. technology yeah. on fertile people, exactly. uh, the most fertile people. That the, uh, really exactly, have. exactly. But you, but you have to make sure that you've got those other things in place because as I say, it's very straightforward, it is complex, straightforward, and really relatively risk-free when it's done right, but it's super messy, very risky, and completely scary when it's not done right. So, so this is, I would find it uh, comforting. Uh, you know, I, I didn't have access to all this information when we were uh, uh, going through the process, but I would find it very comforting to know that this is not a random woman. She's been, first and foremost, screened. Uh, and there's a, a difference between screening and matching. So screening refers to the fact that the, the professionals still first want to make sure that this woman can be a good surrogate, that she it's something that fits her personality, her life. There's going to be a lot of disruption and a lot of you know other things happening uh, to her life. First, you want to make sure that she could be a surrogate. But then there's the next step. Do you want me to outline the screening? Yeah. Okay. 
So this is how I do it, and probably other people too, but I'll speak to my experience, and you just kind of want to think about all, all of the steps I'm, I'm talking about, and I'll shorten it just for the sake of this. So for us, when a surrogate inquires about being a surrogate, and we want a surrogate to come to us, so we're not out there with billboards, you know, make a lot of money, carry baby, we don't want to attract people. We want people to be thinking about it on their own and then come to us. They initially will take a questionnaire about themselves to rule them in or out. So they have to have given birth, they have to have had easy pregnancies and deliveries, they have to live in one of the states where surrogacy is safe and legal and where parental rights are easy to establish. They have to live near a high-level NICU hospital. They have to have health insurance that will either cover surrogacy and put in writing that it will cover surrogacy, or they have to be uh, insurable, and we do apply for insurance for them at this stage. They have to have no history of drug or alcohol abuse, criminal background, or mental health um, history. They have to have support of their, their spouse, their family, their friends, their employer, and they have to be um, self, they have to self-identify as good communicators, have a means of transportation. At this point, it's all self-report. And out of 100 women who fill out that initial questionnaire, about 80% will get a nice email from us letting them know that we're really grateful that they want to do this, but that for some reason or another, they're unable to. The 20% who make it to the next level, we have a, we, we prove all their responses. So we do a full criminal background check, driving, rec, driving dr a DMV check. We look at their taxes, their pay stubs, their housing record. We get letters of recommendation. We do a full OB record review of their own pregnancies as well as a general record review and pediatric review of their kids. And we all of that is reviewed. Out of the 20 or so percent who were looking at their records, about half will make it to the next level. Those are then interviewed by two people, two separate interviews by someone in our admissions team. So why do you want to be a surrogate? What does it mean to you? What are your expectations vis-a-vis -vis the child, the parents, the present, the future? What do you eat? How do you, how do you exercise? What does your boss think? What was your childhood like? What are your children like? It's very intrusive and very comprehensive and only a glimpse of what's to come in terms of how intrusive surrogacy is. Um, out of the 10 women who are interviewed, about five will make it to the next level. Those five then have a preliminary psych screening with a mental health, licensed mental health provider. That is just a screen for the things that often ding a surrogate. And out of that, usually about three will make it. Those three are then flown in to my office where we do a full in-person psychological screening. We screen them, we screen, screen their spouse. If they're single, then, which is fine, they just have to establish with us that they have a full support network. And we do interview their support network. We do um, optional home visits uh, sometimes. Um, and it's really not a check-in. It's more of a kind of getting the whole picture of who the, who the person is. We're not just trying to make sure the surrogate is a good candidate to be a surrogate. We're also trying to make sure that surrogacy will not harm her in any way. Because for the surrogate, unlike for you, the surrogate, surrogacy for a surrogate is optional. It's optional for the surrogate. It's not optional for you if, if it's the way you're going to make your family. So we want to make sure it's not going to harm the surrogate because it's something she's choosing to do for herself. She doesn't have to do it. So, so, uh, so you see how the studies that show that the surrogates are, <laughs> yeah. are doing okay are not just you know, accidental. Yeah. It's because it's most of the reputable agencies in the yeah. United States and, and Canada, for that mm -hmm. matter, would do a, a, you know, a good amount of this screening, mm -hmm. although it's not the same amount and not the same protocol. But everywhere. it's... A, a, so, uh, those aspects that I just described are, are, are hit. For some agencies, they will do it after they match you with a surrogate. So, you know, you'll meet with a surrogate who hasn't been screened and they'll do all of that screening. Or only partially screened. Or partially, or partially screened, screened right. yeah. And then the last step, if she does pass the psychological screen in person, always in person, psychological screening, then we send her to the medical doctor and she has a head to toe physical, uterine ultrasound, and full blood work, HIV, STD, drug, alcohol, and nicotine. And her partner has all of that lab work as well. So 2% of the original 100 women who apply will make it through that screening. But when those 2% make it, who are they? They are a seventh grade math teacher who's got two kids and you know is 32 years old and is super stable. A NICU nurse 
Um, a stay-at-home mom, PTA president, soccer mom. I can't tell you how many surrogates are the PTA president <laughs> and the soccer mom. Um, these women are unbelievable. They are very, very generous. Even though they're being compensated, that has nothing to do with, I think uh, one surrogate figured out that um, she was making, I think it was 13 cents an yeah. hour or something <laughs> like that. And, and, and we, we actually yeah. don't like necessarily that analogy because we don't feel they work for us. Exactly. Right. But I'm saying but that yeah. when people say, like, you're yes, getting yeah. so, you're getting paid right. so and much money. And that is a common, the, a yes, common yes. thing, like, oh, my gosh, you're Sarah. How much did you make? Yeah. yeah. Well, you know what? So Let me tell you all the things that I yeah. did. Yeah. Right. And then you tell me And how it long it took. It. Yeah. Right. Let, let's get that, that to that in a minute. But I first want to say that, yes, uh, uh, these are not random women to begin with. There's mm -hmm. screening and then there's matching. Mm -hmm. So there's a difference between first making sure that she could be a surrogate. Mm -hmm. right. And let me also send something as a preview for tomorrow's medical panel. Mm -hmm. Just this, the way Kim said that part of the screening is not just to make sure that she's going to be good for you as a surrogate, but surrogacy is not going to be bad for her. Right. The same with the medical screening. Mm -hmm. It's not just meant to see that you will get the outcome that you want, but that she will not be harmed right. uh, mm -hmm. as much. So the medical right. and the psychological screening is always with in mind uh, of both uh, the part, both right. parties. So so moving moving forward, so we, we established that uh, you know surrogates have uh, some concerns, uh, intended parents have some concerns. Uh, those concerns are probably overblown because it's not going to be this random uh, uh, person who's going to do this for you. Uh, and expectations are going to be uh, set. Now we are embarking on the process, and we had very good starting points, but we don't just stop there. Once the process starts, there is also room for best practices and mm -hmm. for professional input. So um, I will start with you, uh, Kim. What happens, you know, with you know, A, with the matching in particular, like mm -hmm. why is one surrogate good for one person yeah. not the other, one couple, yeah. uh, but also once the process starts, um, you know, what can be done to facilitate the best relationship yeah. and the smoothest yeah. journey? So, so after all that screening, um, we, when we accept a surrogate into our program, we get, we're, obviously we're getting to know her in that multiple conversations. So we're finding out from her what, what kind of relationship is she hoping for? What are her expectations? Um, what is she wanting out of the relationship? And then with intended parents, we're going to try to understand the same thing. So, you know, we're not asking you to tell us when, you know, we say what kind of surrogate do you want? Well, someone who's healthy, all healthy. Given birth, yep, they've all given birth. So once they've met this high threshold, they're still human beings just like you, with different personalities and different demographics. So the matching is a very complex process. It's based on a matrix of things. So some of it is demographic. So for certain people, depending on where you're from and what your marital status is, you're going to need a surrogate from a particular state or from a particular, even sometimes a particular county in that state for parental rights. It's gotten much better with marriage equality. It's less of a patchwork, but it's still a really important thing to factor in. And then there's your preferences. So you might say, you know, I want a married stay-at-home mom. I want a surrogate who has her own insurance. Some of these decisions will cost you money or save you money or cost you time or save you time. And then there's the personality. I'm a warm, fuzzy, I like to hug type of person. I, I like to text. I want to text every day. I want to go to every appointment. Or I'm a more formal, kind of hands-off type of person, and I'm going to be very happy with a really distant relationship. So all of these things are then factored into a match. I mean, it's kind of like a match.com kind of situation. It's not random. So then when you're presented with a surrogate who it, who is seen to be a good match for you, um, you, you are going to read her profile and you're going to see all of her details and she's going to see yours. And then if you're still a good match for each other, you're going to meet and you're going to have a facilitated conversation where you discuss all of these things, the things that are even like, you know, hard to talk about. Being in the delivery room, what happens if there's something wrong with the baby? What happens if you put in an embryo and it splits into twins? What happens if she loses her job? What happens if all of this, and we talk about all of that. And then all of those details are codified in the contract by the attorney. 
And to clarify that, then that, that goes both ways, right? Yep, so both you're, ways. You're getting a profile and you're looking at these surrogates. Exactly. We think that you would match great with this person. Um, and then at the same time, she would get, or or if you've said yes, agencies do it differently, but then she has the right then to look at that profile and to say, yes, I really, I do like these guys. I do want to work with these guys or to pass that on. And it's okay to get a profile from your agency or vice versa and, and look and be like, mm, you know yeah. what? I'm not sure. Or a, we have a, a Skype meeting and, you know, we just didn't click. We just good, didn't connect. A good agency, if you don't, click either on paper or in person, mm -hmm. the next question they ask is, how can I do better the next time with matching you? Okay. What? How did I miss who right. you are and what you want? Because right. it, there's nothing wrong with saying no to a candidate. And mm -hmm. the way we, we show the surrogate your profile first so that when we're showing you a profile, she's already said yes to you. But some agencies do it the other way. There's no right or wrong way. But you know, this is a a, an intricate matching process. It's not just she's next and you're next and like make it work and figure it out. This yeah, is right. way too complicated and, and, and intimate time, for that. Because some, that's sometimes a misconception. It's not you looking through a catalog. No. So, I mean, unfortunately, that sometimes is what happens with egg donors to the extent mm -hmm. that people will feel like they're looking through a catalog. We think, well, we'll talk about that some other time. But this is really, for most agencies, if you're looking through a catalog, that usually means that that agency did not yet screen them. Mm -hmm. and I, the, and, but, and I want, uh, Michelle, also to ask you, what we also know, and you probably know that, maybe you can uh, relate to that uh, quickly personally, but also uh, uh, generally, a major issue for the matching is the vision about the relationship. Right. So, and you've talked to them, your agency, and shared what that is, uh, and what your vision is, what your communication throughout the journey will be, and what the communication will be after that. Um, and they're going to, you know, work with you to find someone who, who has that. Um, it doesn't always end up that way. Okay, so Ron's heard my story multiple times of my first journey, um, and I and I don't doubt that it was a perfect match. You know, we both went into it saying that they wanted to be to come to all the appointments and that they wanted to be a part of everything and have a relationship afterwards. Um, and on my second OB appointment, I was like texting them and saying, "Okay, you know, I'm I'm checked in, I'm going in, be in five minutes, and then I'll call you." And they texted back, "Oh, I don't think we're going to make this one." I'm trying not to ball in the OB office that they weren't going to be there. Um, and, and again, I think I still think it was a perfect match and I adore them and, and have no regrets on that, but it doesn't always go, I would have never gotten here if, if it weren't for, if I hadn't matched with them. You know that? Um, so it, it might change. Your expectations might come a little bit differently or you might not have that connection that you thought. Um, um, you know. but, but it's important to understand always so you're talking about being mindful that you need to be multi-perspectival here. Understand that there are the different perspectives here and really, if there's a mantra, the surrogate is not uh, a service provider. Well, and one thing, if I may, that you know, sometimes puts people's minds at ease, often I get asked, what's, you know, like what's, what's the worst thing that can happen? Um, in my practice, in my experience, the worst thing that's happened is at, at the end of the day, the intended parents and the surrogate didn't really like each other, and the surrogate still did a great job, carried a healthy baby, delivered it to the parents, and was happy that she had the experience and the parents had, had their baby. So really, the worst thing, if the relationship isn't great, isn't that you're going to, if the surrogate is well screened and a, and a good candidate, she understands that there are different possible outcomes and that it's a real human relationship. So in that, you know, she may be disappointed, you may be disappointed. Right. You all may be like, well, that isn't really what we thought it would be. But you know what? At the end of the day, you're actually not here to make a new friend. If you make a new friend, right. it's gravy. You are here to have a baby. And she is here to help you have that baby. Not as someone that you're using, as a, as a partner. Your partner's in it. So I'd like to move on just by being mindful speaking of being mindful uh, of the time. Um, so we prepared for, the, for this by screening, by matching. Uh, we have mental health professionals and agency staff also facilitating the relationship throughout, uh, trying to, there might be sensitive issues that you would come to the agency first, uh, it, even with the mind of full disclosure and mm -hmm. being into it. And, and, and we know that the outcomes are usually extremely positive because if it's done that way. So let me move uh, beyond that and say, we're not living in isolation. Uh, uh, this is, I always tell people, 
this is going to be the birth story of your child. Mm -hmm. You want to feel, and, and I know that because I, you, you feel that this journey belongs to you, but believe me, it's going to belong to your children much more. It's going to be their identity. So you want to feel good about it. They'll know if you don't feel good about it. So that's what we're doing here. We want to make sure you feel good about it. But you also live in an environment. So I want to ask you, uh, Michelle, um, what kind of adverse or critical or you know, annoying, at the very least, uh, reaction and, and attitudes you, might you have, you have witnessed in your pregnancy and other people that you know right. have gone through this? So the, the two big ones. How much did you get paid? So this concept that you're selling a baby um, or that you're, you went into this for the money, like I said before, no amount of money can, can make up for the pain of, of that. It's, it's all about that moment of giving your child back to you. Um, and um, um, how are you gonna give that, how are you gonna give away your baby? How can you, how can you do that? How can you give away your baby? I'm not going to give away my baby. I'm going to carry someone else's baby, and then I'm going to give it back to them. Um, there's a huge misconception around that. I had a very good friend. She's a very smart, intelligent person, and she's like, "So you and Evan are going to, you're going to have a baby, and then they're going to." No, me and Evan already have three babies. We're gonna, this is a different. So I had to explain to her about how IVF works and how embryo transfers work and how you can make this baby outside of that. So so much of it is not um, negative. I think. Um, I had a lot of negativity from my from my grandmother, who was opposed both to um, surrogacy in general, just you know the concept of you know th this is a life is at at, at um, creation, you know at uh, uh, conception is a life, and so some religious beliefs around there. And then as soon as she found out that I was caring for two men, she took to um, sending me handwritten scripture um, every week, and I would just look at it and throw it away. And we agreed to disagree, and and um, you know we still love each other and it was fine but there are some um, um, some pushback to both of those to both of those pieces um, I think most of it though is a lack of understanding and so you'll get these kind of really stupid questions and you feel like they're being jerks and they're not they just don't know how it works and once you take you know one minute to explain how IVF works and that it's someone else's egg and it's their sperm and it's her uterus and here it is um, they think oh okay that's cool and, 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 and this is really important to understand because you, it's hard for us to recreate the state of <laughs> ignorance, and you're learning so much this weekend. You know, you probably already forget that you didn't know some of it, and and but sometimes it's still annoying right. uh, to hear those questions right. and those uh, and those uh, remarks. Mm -hmm. Karina, incidentally, you have you have uh, a perspective that's wi much wider than uh, than Michelle's. You actually studied this particular uh, uh, issue, and by the way, we have a, a conference in Europe. And this question comes up a lot there, where people say you're somehow breaking down some ho holy uh, wholeness of a motherhood. motherhood yes, um, I I have done, as I said in the introduction, uh, research on uh, surrogacy. I interviewed so many surrogates, and one of the first uh, question that they always receive is, "How can you give up your baby? You are the mother." So. Um, um, surrogates are answering something that are not they are not thinking about it because they don't think that they are mother and uh, through they are very educated about fertility and IVF and uh, from an anthropological point of view um, uh, we said that uh, um, techno me medical technology uh, has disrupted this idea of motherhood in in part so it can be the if you want to find a mother because um, um, there is the egg donor, it could be uh, said like a genetic mother, we can have the birth mother, the social mother, the legal mother, so there is a fragmentation of uh, motherhood and thanks to... Uh, and parenthood. And parenthood, yes, and thanks to reproductive technologies we can now say that there are um, multiple meanings of motherhood. One of the things that we, we believe in your American culture is that carrying a pregnancy means being a mother, but what the surrogates are saying, and uh, I'm not, it's not just me as a researcher that I'm um, finding these uh, interesting points, but there is a literature of a professor of UCLA, uh, Jujia Berend, and also Jacobson, that say that US surrogate disclaim motherhood. They already know that they are not the mother of the child that they are carrying. 
most of the time they use this expression that in Europe are uh, kind, when you hear something like that, you're, oh, this is weird, I'm just an oven. But what it means from a cultural point of view, it means that you are taking care of some, somebody, child, uh, the baby is already created, you can see all the process, all the journey, the in embryos, yes. Yeah, the extreme the in, babysitting. Well, extreme, yes, yeah. and, and one important, uh, one part that I heard, and uh, I think it's very uh, interesting, I heard two uh, sentences that uh, gave me uh, much more uh, knowledge about it. One of them said, I'm a bodybuilder of the baby. It means that I'm creating the body inside of my body, something that is already made. Another one used an expression of Israel, they said, she said, I'm Chava. Chava is the mother of life. I'm giving life, I'm giving birth, but it's not something that belongs to me because it's a creation of relationship between the intended parents and me. And uh, I think it's very important to highlight this part in the surrogacy journey because surrogates are extremely um, annoyed to answer this kind of question. And I think thanks to uh, research and the study, we can show that U.S. surrogacy is not like um, uh, forcing women having babies but because they are educated and they know what they are doing because they are, uh, as Kim said, screened and um, followed throughout the journey. And what I hear from surrogates is that they don't feel like they're making a baby because you're doing that. They do feel like they're making a family. And the reward for surrogates is not at the end looking at holding, cooing over the baby. Mm -hmm. It's looking at the family they've just created. It's yeah. seeing the look yeah. in your eyes, yeah. not the look in the baby's eyes. It's the look in your eyes when you're, you're looking at your baby for the first time or when you're trying to change diapers and the baby pees on you and you mess up the formula and you're, you're being a parent. That's the gold at the end of the rainbow for the surrogate because she's not attached yeah, to the baby, that, but she's very attached to the family. Yeah. And that moment of you know giving your baby to you is just one of the most beautiful things that's ever. Addictive, I would it say. Is, it is. And you know, my husband was not super excited about um, me being a surrogate, and he was less excited about me doing it again. <laughs> um, but for him, that, that first time when he, the dads came in and came in and the and saw them, and he, he came to me later and said, like, okay, now I get it. Mm -hmm. like, I, did not understand why you wanted to be pregnant again. I didn't understand why you wanted to yeah. like make yourself throw up and have this issue. Um, but once I saw them with their babies and hold their babies, it was like, okay, now I get it. One of my surrogates uh, delivered, and uh, it was an easy vaginal, uncomplicated delivery, and the hospital allowed anyone in the room. So the intended parents were in the room, plus one of their sets of parents, yes. and I think a sibling and an aunt, and they were just all. It was, it was amazing, and the surrogate told me oh, that cool. the look mm -hmm. in the aunts mm -hmm. and the grandparents who were grandparents for the first time, the look in their eyes, she said, would fuel her soul forever. It's amazing. And, and once again, it's a matter of you keeping that perspective in, 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 in your mind uh, throughout the journey uh, to understand what this is about. So, so we've taken a, a lot of time, and we only have a few more minutes, um, at Men Having Babies, uh, starting a few years ago, uh, in trying to talk and discuss this with a group of surrogates uh, that uh, Michelle uh, was the leader of at the time, and then Michelle came on our board, to try to articulate some of those things in what we now call the framework, the framework for uh, ethical surrogacy practices. So um, I think those were passed before. Uh, take a look at them. We feel that um, a lot of those things uh, are things that people have strong gut feelings about, but it's, it, hel it helps to articulate them. Uh, because you will hear people saying all kind of things. You will hear people saying, how much do you pay her? You will hear people saying, you know, uh, you know things that would refer to the surrogate as somebody that works for you, or things that would uh, maybe criticize you for for being this, you know, powerful man, uh, uh, somehow exploiting, uh, exploiting mm -hmm. a, a weaker yeah. woman, uh, and we wanted to give all these issues uh, thought in in principle, and also come up with some guidelines, uh, what we call baseline protocols for agencies and clinics that are part of our network, because we think there are, you know, right and wrong ways of going about it, and also what's the thickest part of this framework are the best practices. 
and we're close to releasing best practices for surrogates, surrogates as well. Mm -hmm. One of the main uh, issues that uh, we address there is the issue of compensation. We'll talk about it some more, and Michelle's going to be on the panel of the, um, at, during the budgeting and insurance, uh, which is otherwise a very practical uh, panel, but we're going to address there um, in brief what rationale. we think uh, the issue for the rationale for the compensation. But why don't you take a minute just to give the highlights, because we may or may not have the exact same audience. Uh, why do we think that surrogates deserve money, mm -hmm. and what for? So that compensation is for the disruption, the discomfort, and the risk for the surrogate and her family. And I emphasize this quite a bit. Um, it is a disruption in your life to have to stop and take shots at 7 o'clock every night for three months. It is a disruption to have to go to doctor's appointments. And there's more doctor's appointments for this than there would be for a typical pregnancy because you're, you're having more appointments up front. Um, there's a disruption. Um, you can't lift your baby. Right. You know. Thank you. Um, so, and the discomfort in your life, obviously, discomfort of pregnancy. Um, I can go on for hours and hours about the 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 challenges there of morning sickness and heartburn and and lots of other gross things that you don't want to hear about right now. I'll save that for your surrogate to tell you about. Um, and then there is a risk to your life. There is an inherent risk in a, in any pregnancy, a risk of of loss of reproductive ability. Um, I had a postpartum hemorrhage after my last child, um, and and bled out and had to have a blood transfusion. It was not fun. My husband face was frightening um, watching your wife go into the hospital to have to have a blood transfusion. There's a risk that, that goes along with that. And that discomfort and disruption goes along with the family. So again, you know, not being able to pick up your small child when you're in the later stages of a pregnancy is hard on a kid to understand that. Um, having sexual restrictions puts a big impact on your relationship and on marriage to not be able to be intimate with your partner for a period of time. Um, not being able to cook because you're too tired and have a takeout all the time. They actually got sick of it. Um, so, so there's a a lot of those three pieces that go into to that and that we feel that really surrogates um, deserve a fair compensation for those things. And, and it, it might sound trivial and some people refer to these of course in other terms instead of disruption you talk about time and effort instead of uh, discomfort you talk about pain and suffering we think that our terms are a little more uh, uh, palatable exactly. and, and, and to the point but what is implied here is is that they're not being compensated for the baby you're not buying a baby from them. They're not being compensated for renting the womb to you, which is literally how just, yeah. surrogacy is referred to in some languages. And, it, and it's clear uh, in that contract, you know, regardless of if there's a live birth at the end, there's compensation for the time of the pregnancy, even if that pregnancy is lost at, at 12 weeks, 14 weeks, 24 weeks, uh, unfortunately it happens. Um, but I, I was still pregnant and I still had those challenges in my life. And while there are obligations and it is a contract, they're not being compensated for output or for performance. Uh, it's not, there isn't a surrogate that gets a bonus because she really ate the right food or something like that. That is the same, by the way, with egg donors. Exactly. Their, com their compensation is, it's irrelevant if they, get, if they yield one, one egg, egg zero egg. eggs, or 20 eggs. Exactly. Compensation is the same. So, um, so really, I encourage you, since we are out of time, uh, to look through these um, you know, guidelines, et cetera. There's some, talk there about how the surrogate needs to be fully informed and, and how she you know, needs to be making you know, a fully conscious decision, how she needs to be in, uh, represented independently, legally. Uh, I, I'm not just brushing those things aside. The reality is that in the United States, that's 99.9% .9 the case anyhow. Uh, but we wanted, uh, and, in, and in Canada, uh, so, but we wanted you to, uh, we still, I think it's still very valuable to, to understand those things. Uh, if nothing else, so that you can answer your uh, angry uncle or aunt at uh, Thanksgiving. <laughs>